Hey everybody, and welcome to the PC Gamer Show. My name is Tom Marks. Welcome everyone. I'm assistant editor here at PC Gamer with Chris Livingston, our staff writer. Hello. James Davenport, associate editor. Hey. And our very special guest, Jesse Rapzik, co-founder of Studio Wildcard, who makes uh, Ark Survival Evolved. Welcome to the show, Jesse. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, we're excited to have you. So uh, let's jump right into it. For those of you who are frequent watchers of the show, you will notice we are not back in the office yet. I can say in confidence, though, this time, and I know I've said this twice before, so none of you believe me anymore, but we <laughs> will be broadcasting the show from the office next week. Uh, next week's show, we will have the studio set up, and we will be back in no longer over Skype. Um, but the plus side of that is that Jesse is coming to us from Seattle, or uh, Bellevue, excuse me, the greater Seattle area, if you will, so we can get him on before we go back to an in-person show. Um, let's jump right in. Let's start with just our now playing. What have we been playing lately? Let's start with James. What have you been playing this last week? Uh, well, obviously, I'm still on that Fallout 4 uh, bit, chasing that nuclear... Uh, lust, um, and I can't stop. But <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll talk more about that in a bit, no doubt. Uh, um, otherwise, I I I peeled myself away from it enough, uh, long enough to play a game. Uh, I've never said it out loud, never never heard the name out loud. So I apologize to the creators or people who know the name. Um, it's called Sibel Sibylle, something I like it was, that. I thought it was Sibyl. Sybil, is that how to say it? Sybil, maybe? Maybe I'm completely wrong about that, but... It's probably said out loud at some point. How do you spell it? C-I-B-E-L-E. Okay. Uh, and it's it's a really short uh, narrative game uh, by Nina Freeman, and she does a lot of small vignettes, um, some really cool, poetic, personal, uh, experimental games. And she's also working for uh, Fulbright now um, on their next game, which uh, the name escapes me right now. Mm, gone home, much? people. What's oh, that? Uh, Tacoma. Tacoma. There you go. Um, and this game is—it's basically uh, a short story set or communicated through interacting with like a fake desktop. Like you're—it's like you're using this character's desktop, and you're playing from the perspective of, I guess, uh, a 19-year-old. Um, throughout the course of several years, uh, playing this MMO, going to college, and, you know, going through some social, uh, sexual changes. And it, it's, it uses, like, MMO language, as in MMOs being, especially the one it's based on. Uh, I think it's based on, like, Final Fantasy twelve or eleven or whatever the first one was. It's, it's a very, very grindy click fest. Um, so it's kind of a cool, like... Uh, the, most of what you're doing is like playing this fake MMO, clicking on enemies while two characters just talk. And they develop a relationship and things happen. And uh, it has a lot to do with like uh, feeling uh, wanted and feeling uh, comfortable in a space. And I mean, I don't think this will be for everyone, but uh, for me, I really, I, it, it struck uh, a chord because I don't know. I grew up in a small town, uh, and I didn't identify with a lot of the people in my town. Um, being the weirdo I am, I somehow landed in PC gamer. But uh, I, I think uh, it, it's a really cool hour-long experience for people who maybe grew up and made friends in a digital space of some kind. So I, 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 re I really want to recommend it to people who have made friends in a digital space, or at least like developed relationships in the di digital space or like came of age in a digital space of some kind. Um, so that's really all I want to say about it. Uh, get out there, play it. It's fun. It's cool. J James, I feel like every time like you talk for more than like 30 seconds, you just get really deep and personal. I, I, I do. I unload. Uh, people say I'm very easy to uncork. <laughs> <laughs> just let me go and I start pouring out. So, so Sybil. Well, that's that's it's good that you have a, a good experience with it then. <laughs> yeah. uh, personally, I'm going to go to myself now because um, I'm really excited about... I was playing a lot of Binding of Isaac this past weekend, Binding of Isaac Rebirth and its Afterbirth mm. DLC. 
um, because the creators had this huge, like, ridiculous, weird ARG that went with the game. Um, if anybody who doesn't know an ARG is like an augmented reality game, Valve is had the most notable one, I think, where they did one for Portal 2 a while back. And they were hiding things around like santa cruz they buried something in santa Ana, california that you had that they literally had to go dig up i ca- i sent edmund mcmillan the head of team meet an email i was like hey can you what can you tell me about this arg and he responded with nothing but bring a shovel <laughs> that was the entire email and then they ended up having to bring a physical shovel to this place in santa Ana and like dig up the next clue of the thing and when they finally completed it it unlocked a new character in the game permanently um, which is like a really cool way to engage your community. And I just kind of got like really excited about the game through that and, and ended up playing a lot of Binding of Isaac. Um, it's, you know, it's one of those games that you can just get lost in because it's just, it's a roguelike and you just die and start over and die and start over and just keep going. Um, how far did you get? Hmm? How far did you get? Uh, this is going to sound really weird to anybody who hasn't played the game before. <laughs> exactly but, why I asked. <laughs> yeah, um, but I, for those of you who have played the game before, you'll know what I'm talking about. I killed mom three times, and then I killed the devil once. And that's technically the farthest I've gotten, is killing the devil. Um, that game was really weird and really, really ridiculous and fun. Um... But it's it's just it's so funny because it's all about like this procedurally generated levels and and you know finding different items that change the way you attack and then those items interact with each other. So the the great thing about the game that I like is that you can find these combinations of items that are completely randomly generated that make you feel so powerful when you start out the game. You feel so weak, and then by the end of it, you can just feel like insanely strong. Um, so it's a it's just a really nice arc in every um, in every run basically. Uh, Jesse, what about you? What have you been playing? I imagine Ark Survival Evolved is going to be on that list. Uh. Yes, you know we're pretty much in the thick of game development, so most of the gaming I do is for research purposes on problem solving, either visuals or content production that we're currently working on. Huh. Um, this week we've been playing a lot of Tomb Raider, just uh, checking out their um, uh, tombs and the way they've constructed their environments. Uh, you know, in Ark we have not released yet, but ruins that are coming to the game uh, that reveal a lot of the backstory. And you know, in, in Tomb Raider, uh, you, a lot of it's you know going through these old ruins and discovering secrets by investigating them and kind of learning uh, about, you know, the game's backstory that way. And, and art's a little bit like that in, in the way its ruins work. And, you know, so the content team, the art team's just been looking at that, looking at the way they did their ice. And, you know, we have an ice cave that we're working on that we're releasing soon. So just kind of comparing techniques, picking everything apart. Uh, you know, it's a, it tends to be... Uh, less niche. We look at a lot of AAA games for their their visual fidelity because we're always trying to, you know, merge in kind of best practices from the the industry and the, the best uh, artists out there, and and trying to somehow fit it into this crazy large open world sandbox game that we have. And sometimes it's really hard. But every time a new game comes out, and you're like, dang, they really did that really well. And we've got something the same in our game. How can we kind of like take from what they're doing? And, you know, that's the beauty of, I guess, being in early access is, you know, nothing's permanent until we need to lock down the ship so we can go back in and kind of tweak things and uh, change our approach to, to some of the things that we're doing. And so, you know, other than that, of course, uh, checking out Fallout uh, through, I would say, my lead environment artist who sits right next to me and it just plays the game during all his breaks because of course he's looking at all the beautiful art and everything so I do a lot of watching of that one <laughs> it's uh, it's too much uh, time for me to get into that game I'll get absorbed and sucked into it which I can't afford to do at the moment but uh, it's a beautiful game and I you know I've been really enjoying uh, watching him go through that as well but yeah it's research right like you said <laughs> yeah I mean it's it's funny because I don't really get to sit down and just enjoy games unless we're not like in a you know very uh, hardcore uh, development cycle, which we are right now. Working on console, working on Xbox. You know, art's a very difficult game to squeeze down on the console, and so almost all of our spare time is is uh, 
sucked up by working more and not actually doing you know the the fun things we would like to do. Uh, so yes, it is a lot of playing Arc, a lot of uh, playing those other games, and a lot of just planning and and iterating and testing. You know, I was playing Arc on Xbox for a few hours this morning, f five hours this morning, <laughs> just <laughs> finding issues and and making notes for the team and stuff like that. So, so when when you play Arc, then do you go in as like an admin character, or do you just jump onto random servers and and have that kind of more natural experience with it? Because I know uh, you came on the, the stream a while back and we were spawning in dinosaurs left and right. Right. Uh, usually it's mm, a private server because when we're putting in new things to the game, we don't have time to really f go into like our official server and try to like build up all the experience. But we still want to see how it fits in with everything that's next to it in the game. So we host our own private servers, we up our taming speed and experience and all that stuff so we can like blaze through parts of the game really quickly. We also have saved games we keep around for, you know, content. We'll come back to, you know, the giant village we have built to, you know, test out uh, the new items we're creating and put them in context with all the other items and uh, try out new dinosaurs, how they navigate things and, you know, everything uh, to shorten our, our testing cycle internally that we can do. And usually we only go into the official servers if we're really just wanting to observe, see how people are enjoying the content, what they do like, what they don't like, if they're finding any bugs, uh, things like that. So, Very cool. Well, and lastly, Chris, and this will probably transition into our, our next topic, but uh, what have you been playing lately, as if I didn't know the answer? Yeah, I've been uh, playing Fallout 4, more or less, um, constantly, or maybe not constantly, but exclusively. I haven't really played anything else uh, in the last two weeks. Um, I took one character through the uh, main story, which I won't give any details on. Um, but I kind of, uh, I, I have to say, I think it's probably the best job um, Bethesda's done with their main stories. Um, typically when I would, in the other games like the uh, uh, Skyrim or Oblivion or the other, or Fallout 3, I kind of just went through the story just to do it, just to get it done. Um, this, I found myself pretty interested uh, the whole way, and my progression was kind of, a, res a result of like genuinely uh, being intrigued by the story and wanting to get some answers and um, especially wanting to see how certain character relationships were resolved um, so I think they did a, a pretty good job with that I'm pretty pretty pleased with it do you think that was at all like in part due to the fact that that your character speaks now and you can see them in a more personal level or um it's, you know, that could be part of it. I mean, there were, um, you did feel more like you were having a conversation, I guess. Um, I think, yeah, I think that could have been part of it. Um, I think the rest of it is that it was just, I think, a pretty interesting story, or at least an intriguing one. Um, and I kind of really felt like, wow, I, I really want to know what's going on here and what's actually at the root of these situations in this world so it could be a combination of those i think okay and that's that's interesting to hear because i was talking to one of our uh, our video editors actually in the office yesterday and, and he said he'd been playing the game for 10 hours at this point and he hadn't left the starting town he had just been building it and like upgrading oh. weapons and and he he the story wasn't even on his radar basically yeah, I think, you know, <clears throat> this this character I took through the story, the others I have, um, I haven't really done anything with the story. It seems like either way you go, there's stuff to keep you, you know, interested and entertained. Was this the luck character? The luck in, no, in Charisma? No, I, I had to basically, I'd like to get back to him someday, but he was just so bad at combat. And um, maybe it's my imagination, it just feels like, so much of this is, are these huge fights. You know, I know there were really big, drawn-out fights in the other uh, Bethesda Fallout games, but this really feels like very early on you'll find yourself in, in massive firefights. I feel like they really doubled down with these, like, major confrontations that start pretty early. Um, 
And my my charisma guy, you know, I was only using perks from from charisma and um, and luck. So he really was not. He had some some benefits in a fight. Like he had a perk where uh, occasionally when someone's shooting at you, if they miss, the bullet will ricochet and will kill them instantly. Which is really funny when it happens. In fact, it happened twice in the same fight with two guys. So it was just. <laughs> Like one of them shot and was like ping and he dropped and then the next guy shot and was ping and he dropped and it was like that's it, um, but it doesn't happen often enough to like save your butt that much. Uh, so I kind of had to, I kind of put him by the wayside because when he does have to really get into a fight, he's terrible. So. Well, so you mentioned also yesterday in a meeting that you you kind of started trying out a different character that was weird and you might want to do something on, but. Like, you're the expert at playing games the way they're not supposed to be played. So how are you, how are you seeing Fallout in that? You know, like you, you walked across Oblivion, right? How do you, or was it Skyrim? I can't remember now. I'm sorry. It was both. Okay, excuse me. You delivered presents in Skyrim as Santa Claus. <laughs> Is Fallout conducive to that sort of also that silliness? Um. You know, I, I haven't had a lot of time. Like, a lot of this, these kind of experimental things happen kind of when I'm done with a game, but I'm not, I don't want to be done with it. Like, I want to wring some more fun out of it or enjoy the world enough that I want to keep spending time there. Even when I've, I've done the main quests, I've done most of the side quests, I kind of know my way around. Um, so it's kind of early to say. I, I would say that it it seems pretty conducive. I mean, it seems... You know, it's a Bethesda RPG. There's there seems to be a lot of different ways to entertain yourself that aren't, you know, about doing missions. Um, especially now that there's this sort of settlement um, portion where you can, you know, you build a settlement and you get little people come to town and they start working or guarding or farming, and then you can go, you know, I don't know how many there are. There's a whole bunch, and then you can kind of set up these supply chains and. Um, so it's, I mean, it's a, it's a good game to not really play while spending a lot of time in it, uh, as far as I can tell so far. Cool. What about you, James? Have you, have you, you said that was the other game you'd been playing, right? Yeah. Uh, I've been playing a lot. My, my thoughts on it aren't like changing drastically. I, I think I'm enjoying myself. I'm not, I mean, I'm running into the typical Bethesda, uh, open world bugs, nothing catastrophic. Though I definitely feel like I'm seeing a lot more outrage at it this time around. And I mean, despite uh, Bethesda releasing like a super massive, dense game, there's a lot of outrage about the bugs. And secondly, about the size of the world. Um, it's not particularly like massive uh, compared to. I don't know, maybe Skyrim or um, other open world games, but I, 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 that's something that's been bothering me, and maybe we can talk about this at some point, and I, I'll probably write about it, but I don't understand why people, uh, or the general idea of having an open world, um, maybe it's because of like technology expands, so we can make a bigger world, and people just want a bigger world, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be more fun. <laughs> Um, and I think the density and the smaller, I, w I won't say small because it's not small, but in Fallout 4 the density is like enough, uh, more than enough to keep you entertained like uh, more often than not as opposed to maybe, uh, people have been saying Just Cause 3 is huge and that seems to be a bullet point and I don't understand like why that matters unless the things you're doing in that world or if that world is conducive to fun. Um, so... Got that off my chest. Uh, <laughs> well, we can talk about that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I like, would agree with that from the developer's perspective. It's really a lot of work to fill any size world, and the larger it gets, you know, you really run like an exponential risk of it being less fun. I mean, you know, you, you're fewer and far between, especially if it's a multiplayer game of seeing other people. A single player game, it's even more stressful for the developer because you have to actually put stuff in there that's interesting. Whereas in a multiplayer game, you could kind of hopefully rely on, on people 
you know, role playing or, or populating the world and doing their own stuff. You know, you know. Fortunately, we have that benefit with art. But people are always asking us if we're going to make the world bigger, like all the time. And you know, we always have to remind them that well, no, because you know, it's there's so many reasons from gameplay to time in the schedule to you know just the limits of technology in what we're trying to do. It's 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 just so challenging all around. And when it does get distilled down to a bullet point of huge world, it's like, well, in and of itself, that doesn't really mean anything. You know, if the game's not fun and it's a huge world, maybe 10% of people are going to enjoy that aspect versus if it is a little bit more condensed and there's a lot more to do, there's a lot more things happening. You know, I think that's the trade-off. Um, so I would tend to agree with you wholeheartedly on that point. Right. Yeah, when I was playing um, GTA V, it was really the, one of the first times I thought, like, I think this world is maybe too big, or maybe there's just not enough stuff in it. I thought, I mean, it was it was beautiful, and there were obviously tons of things, but I just found myself a lot of times just like, you know, it sounds like a strange thing to complain about in a in a game about driving cars, but I was like, I've been driving on this highway for like ten minutes <laughs> to get, you know, to get to the next mission and or I'm flying over, they're just huge, I mean, it's, I guess it's realistic, I mean, obviously, the, the real world isn't populated with things every 10 feet, but I really felt a lot while playing that game, like, there's this whole batch of land that I, I have no use for, it just seems to be between, you know, the, the place I am and the places I want to be, um, there's that one highway that goes around the coast, and I just, I feel like I spent so much time on it, and just driving, and I mean, you know, driving is fine, but um, you know, there were points where I was like, I'm going to call a cab and do the fast travel thing, which you can't, you know, you can't do that in multiplayer. So, um, you know, when you're in multiplayer GTA and you're on one side of the map, you know, it's, I mean, obviously you can steal a plane and stuff. Um, but I did feel like, the th I, think, I think the size, I think they maybe went a little overboard with the size of this. The Fallout? Do you think it's maybe too big? No, not in Fallout, in GTA Five. Oh, okay. In 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 Fallout, I feel like um, it it definitely feels denser than the other games. Um, I can't say I felt that it's it's too big or too small. Um, probably because I'm not completely familiar with it yet. I mean, there are whole portions of the map I haven't even been to yet, even having completed the story. So, um, but I, I haven't felt like it's it's too small. It definitely seems denser than they have been in the past. Yeah, and I kind of appreciate like the verticality of some of the stuff in like the uh, city portion. It's kind of cool to, at least the first time I was uh, exploring that part of the game, I was just you know getting lost in like the different levels of the buildings, and it was cool to like you're getting shot from somewhere, and it's someone on a floor above you like across the way. Um, and then, like you said, Chris, sometimes a huge battle would unfold, and it wouldn't just be, uh, like, you know, on the ground, a bunch of, like, uh, dolls shooting at each other. It was, like, there's some stuff up here on this roof, and there's uh, super mutants on the ground over here, and there's, like, you know, it it, it just feels so much more dense, and, and the, the systems that Bethesda games are known for are, like, uh, while they're imperfect, I think they seem to be... Uh, my coalescing in Fallout 4 better than they have in the past. Um, so I've been enjoying that. Uh, I, I, I have barely touched the story, so I'm excited to know that, or that's the general trend is people have been saying the story is pretty great um, because I don't remember a damn thing about like any other, almost any Bethesda RPG story. <laughs> New Vegas, but that was Obsidian, I guess. Um, uh, if I do have one real beef, it's that nothing really feels that weird in, in this game um, or distinct. Like, and I, I hate to compare it to other post-apocalyptic scenarios because they're doing what they're doing. But the factions so far, and at least the tone, like the factions, there's the, the uh, Brotherhood of Steel, and they just feel like the same kind of thing, like we're... We live by our code, and we stick to it, and we obey, and then the Minutemen are kind of like the, the, the Liberators and uh, other groups you discover. Uh, they all kind of feel like distinct archetypes, uh, and they're, I don't know, they don't feel as like 
I'm just kind of waiting for some real strange post-apocalyptic group or characters to show up. Uh, and I've seen some of that. I don't mean it's like not there entirely, but I feel like i got to dig for it more than I'd like to. Um, some of that I'm finding in just wandering around. And uh, I did find a, a school with a certain, without spoiling anything, go south and look for a charter school. And uh, if you start seeing pink ghouls, you'll know you're close. Um, <laughs> Did you see the um, the somebody found a piece of the Nostromo in the game? Yeah, yeah, and there's plenty, of, a lot of cool Easter eggs. So yeah, there's the Nostromo, right? There's okay, you looked at it. Uh, can you explain that? Yeah, it's it was just just absurdly deep and and hidden piece of of Easter egg for Alien, where the Nostromo, you know, is the ship from the movie Alien. Mm-hmm. Um, and somebody found an item in a box that was called, I think, a flux relay. And it was this kind of weird looking panel, right? Or flux panel or something like that. And they looked at the item in their inventory and then they turned it around. And on the back of the item, there was a serial code in like, and it wasn't this bright thing. Like, look at me, look at me. It was like blue embossed on blue metal, right? It was really passively there barely there at all and they googled that serial code because why would you not and apparently it's the serial code of the nostromo from alien which means that this is a piece of that ship and so it was just there's this incredibly odd completely hidden detail in the game i never find that stuff i was excited when i found someone with a boston accent i was like hey there's someone (laughs) in here with a boston accent finally i never find the to cool hidden stuff myself. Um, yeah, I mean that stuff. It, it's 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 hard to find, and I wish there was more of it. Well, that's um, the internet's job, uh, right? Yeah. So do you have yeah. do you, do you have I, hidden stuff in your in your game, Jesse? Oh yeah. You have, yeah. <laughs> We're adding more of it too. Yeah. Have, have, um, because have they found most of, it? Most have they of found our... everything that's in there yet? <laughs> Well, no, not exactly, but there's also more stuff we're putting in. Uh, I, I'm, I'm actually responding to Twitch chat about some stuff right now. Um, the, you know, one of the big things we still have to add to ARC is our kind of exploration backstory stuff. A lot of the things that you would need kind of an open world to hide. And we're really excited to get that stuff in there. You know, it's not going to be in for our initial um, Xbox game preview launch, but it'll come in uh, shortly after and kind of wind up with our PC build. Uh, but that's our end game content, our additional bosses, our ruins, our explorer nodes, all the motivation to interact with the world, which we hope is just as entertaining as interacting with other players. Because right now we're very multiplayer focused, like you need other people to kind of do, do things in the game, kind of choose your own adventure type scenario. Uh, but when we put in this layer of exploration and discovery that we've always had uh, kind of on the, the back burner up until now, uh, we're really excited to see how people are maybe playing the game in a different way, getting a almost single player experience with whether they're offline or online and kind of merging the co-op multiplayer into some weird genre bending results we hope so <laughs> we'll see how it goes and to everyone to everyone asking jesse questions in the chat we will you will have more of an opportunity to do that as well towards the end of the stream when we do our, our q a um but on that topic of ex- exploration just going back to like world size for a bit i'm the type of person that loves huge worlds even if they are kind of barren to a certain extent uh one of the examples that comes to my mind, and this is not, a, unfortunately, tragically, if you will, not a PC title, um, but Red Dead Redemption. Red Dead Redemption had this huge world that, for the most part, felt pretty empty, but it also was just so fun to explore. I never wanted to fast travel in that game because I just liked going around the outback. And I liked finding those little moments where you see something on the ground and it's like, oh, that might actually be something like a piece of the Nostromo, you know? It, I, That's kind of what I love about open world games. But at the certain same way, I guess it also sort of is what burns me out on open world games eventually. Um, well, so I, I have a question real quick on this same topic, which is do you guys think that if a game needs a fast travel system, 
it's like is that in itself a failure of some sort i i feel like it's just it's mind-boggling to me i don't know if you could say it's a failure because i mean even in your example of red dead one of the things i really liked about that game is the fast travel was so integrated into the lore of the game i mean get mm-hmm. on a stagecoach and you can instantly go like it, it it's a fast travel but it feels like it makes sense you know yeah. it's not just like poof like we do an arc, <laughs> uh, and you're in another place, you know. Uh, well, that's so. that's that's totally fair, and I I guess I guess failure is too way too harsh of a word for me to have used, but it just is. It's hilarious to me that you could make a game world so big that y- you as a developer recognize that oh man, like people aren't gonna want to walk through this every time, and then give them a way to circumvent the thing that you put into the game. You know, like it, it's and I understand the use for it and I understand why it's a great thing to have. And I, I'm by no means <laughs> saying that games shouldn't have fast travel systems. It's just that it's just such it's so weird to me that games got so big that they needed a way to skip the game. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a matter of like, yeah, it's a matter of convenience. I think like the best times I have in Fallout and games like that are when I'm not fast traveling. I just like go on this ex- expo- exploration binge, you know, and I just kind of walk around and find myself bouncing around but then like reality sinks in and i gotta do shit <laughs> like in my life that isn't playing games and i'm like ah you know hell with it i just hop down to you know uh you know sanctuary and it's good um i think <laughs> i think like you were saying though is uh jesse is that like when red dead does it well because it integrates it into uh the, you know, the story and the lore so well. But Fallout and Skyrim, I, admittedly, they don't. It's just like, bet, you're there. And it's kind of jarring still to this day when I do it. But, yeah. But it's also, it's not like, and I didn't mean to say that a fast travel system in any way, like, it doesn't degrade my experience of the no. game or the world no. by any means, right? That That's not at all what I was trying to say. It's just... But yeah, it, it but, is. But it can because I mean, another example that I really enjoyed was Destiny. I mean, I thought their fast travel was great. You get to even customize your fast travel vehicle, like your ship, you know. And it's like mm-hmm. it makes it a feature that's rewarding for the fact that you're you're actually doing it, you know. And there's not really another way to get places in Destiny other than that. So it's kind of like the de facto way to do it. Um, but I I really think when it's done right and it's done like Red Dead and it's done like. Um, D- Destiny, then the fast travel becomes something that actually layers on and enhances the gameplay. And I, I, I do agree that in games like Skyrim and stuff like that, it can be very jarring when you're just poof, you're in another place. And I mean, you know, we kind of do that in Ark a little bit too. I mean, you, you fast travel between beds. Uh, there's a consequence for doing it because you can't take any of your stuff. So we, we really do try to encourage people to actually use the transportation in the game, the dinosaurs and stuff like that. But, I mean, there is kind of the reality of, of especially multiplayer gameplay as well, mm-hmm. in, in that people need to find each other. You know, you kind of have to, like, sus- suspend some disbelief in areas where if you would just want to get on and, and, you know, like you are talking about earlier, we don't all have all the time in the world and you, you want to start playing with your friends within 10 minutes, you know, you got to kind of get to where they are and just kind of forget about all the, you know, the reality of, of the backstory and all that stuff and the lore and just kind of get there and start playing. And, you know, uh, it, it's, it goes into normal gameplay as well, too, when you're trying to get between places and meet up with your friends or, or you know, attack different strategies. And uh, so... You know, I don't know if it's so much as a, a failure, but it's more of like uh, any game that does this, I think, is kind of, I would say, appeasing to the player base. I mean, like, I think players would murder us if we didn't have fast travel in the game because the island's so huge and nobody, like, wants to be forced to, like, walk or fly during everything that they do. And, you know, the, our fast travel system was very much implemented because players wanted something like that. Um, and it's kind of evolved a little bit from that. But I can imagine that all the other games in testing with, with any large world, it's like the first request is like, all right, how are we getting from A to B without having to, you know, drive the car or take the train or do the thing I've done once and I'm already bored with it, you know, because there's a big subset of players who don't enjoy repeating that experience and just want to get to the, the, the key points the, between them. And you have to balance it with the players that really do like to enjoy the world and, and the story behind everything. And I, You can't make everybody happy, but hopefully people can have a choice of how they want to play the game through, through these systems. 
Well, let's uh, let's transition to a a different part of kind of Fallout, but also uh, bigger games in general. James, you wrote this amazing piece last week. Amazing. Uh. <laughs> it was amazing. It was phenomenal. I'm going to link it into the chat right now, and everyone should go find it. If you're listening on YouTube or the podcast, uh, Google or go to PCGamer.com and search for Fallout 4 versus Metal Gear Solid 5, or just Best Dog. Basically, James wrote this piece comparing dog meat from Fallout 4 with D-Dog from Metal Gear Solid 5, <laughs> and which was the dog of the year, the PC gamer dog of the year. Um, but I want to talk a little bit, not specifically about why D-Dog is a better dog, which I will fight to the death about, um, <laughs> but also just companion AI, because that's really what it comes down to at the end of the day, right? Is I saw... That, that GIF, that YouTube video of Fallout 4 where the guy is slowly disarming the laser traps. He's in this front of this, like, this hallway of laser traps. Like, laser beams, like, uh, Mission Impossible style. And he's slowly crawling along, disarming these traps one by one. And then he just turns, and Dogmeat just walks through the traps, and they all explode, and he dies immediately. <laughs> and... Companion AI is an incredibly important thing in single-player experiences like this, or in Ark's case, uh, multiplayer experiences. And it seems like it's so hard to get right. It's so hard to get something feeling right with a companion. Even if you go back to something like Resident Evil 4, I believe, you know, you were you were escorting... I can't even remember her name now. Ashley, was that her name? You're escorting, like, the president's daughter around, yeah. and it's just, like tooth pulling painful right it's just awful to deal with and in a game like metal gear solid 5 it's the other end of the spectrum where you don't have to deal with your companions at all and they just exist and they're perfect right they can never get in the way they can never give you away really they they handle themselves um so i i, I guess the point i'm driving at is which way which way feels more unrealistic or which way feels like takes you out of the game more to a certain extent of ai that you just have to babysit constantly or ai that just manages itself i think you kind of want to have a an easier time like you don't want your companion constantly you know tripping you up screwing things up i think you want them to take care of themselves otherwise it it just turns the game into an escort mission and escort missions are typically the worst part of games having to worry about what someone else is doing what they're up to um you know and i was actually thinking uh earlier today because these companions in in fallout 4 they never die they you know when they get hurt they just kind of crouch down and they cry and you have to give them a med kit or just wait and i was kind of thinking about like yeah it would be a pain if they died and obviously you know, they all have backstories and interactions and it would kind of suck to take a companion out and they're immediately killed and then you miss all that content and they're irreplaceable. But at the same time, having them be these sort of godlike creatures that can never die also feels weird in a way. So I think it's it's kind of tricky to, to balance like, well, I always want them around, but at the same time, them being completely unkillable feels weird. You know, I want them to stay out of my way, but at the same time, it feels weird when they're, you know, flawless. So I think it's a, t it's a tough area to kind of get right. Amberground in our chat mentioned uh, Elizabeth from Bioshock Infinite as being one of the best companions. And she's also one of those companions that just, she's never in danger. She gives you lots of ammo. Right. I, th I think, like, for me, uh, as long as the, as long as I'm, Hmm. If I, as a player, like feel threatened, um, and like there at least the illusion that like if I'm threatened, my companion is threatened. Like if, as long as there's like a, a convincing illusion there that we're both in danger. Um, maybe in a narrative game like Bioshock Infinite, like it's okay because if Elizabeth was dying all the time, it'd be really annoying. She is basically invisible, invincible, um, and more of a mechanic than. You know, like a a companion character, or excuse me, a companion a companion AI. Um, in games like uh, Fallout and all the Bethesda RPG, well, all 
Bethesda RPGs prior to this point, because um, you know, like Chris was saying, they can't die in this one. It's really it's it's off-putting because you're spending a long time with these characters, um, and you see like four. <laughs> happened the other day. I was getting chased by like uh, four suicide um, super mutants and dog meat doesn't make a difference. So dog meat runs towards them and like three of them blow up at once and they're you know they're, they have mini nukes so it's just this huge huge explosion and debris goes flying everywhere. Physics is doing its thing um, and you know it's giblets and I walk over and dog meat's just like ow ow. <laughs> and that's definitely off putting and I think you know Part of the reason I'm like not attached to dog meat emotionally is because I don't feel like dog meat can be harmed. Whereas, like in Infinite, if it's a narrative like arc that you know, or a narrative beat, a deliberate narrative beat, then you know it makes more sense. In these simulation games, uh, I almost liked it better when my companions could die because that was permanent, and it's like I could go 40 hours with uh, what was the Skyrim one, Lydia, 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 um, Lydia, and like. We were buds, and all of a sudden, like a frost troll just pops out of nowhere and knocks her off a cliff, and she's done. And I was, that was horrifying, but like a really cool moment. Um, so, personally, as long as the illusion is uh, kept somewhat intact, uh, and it depends on the type of game, I'm okay with invincible characters that are, you know, minimal, um, but it's tough. I've uh, I've played Fallout for maybe only a total of four hours yeah. at the most. I really haven't played much Fallout 4. And I've probably hit dog meat with, I think, four Molotov cocktails. <laughs> I, I got into a fight with Deathclaw, and I got a little scared, and he was in the way. So I, I feel your pain on the dog meat being unkillable. But what I guess, Jesse, how do you guys handle it in, in terms of your dinosaur partner AI, because I know you can set them to a bunch of different AIs. You can set them to passive or aggressive, but how important was, or how much on your mind was like those dinosaurs getting in your way when you were designing that? Well, our first pass at the AI, which is kind of in there now, is more about trying to make sure they're not too annoying, um, because it is hard to come up with convincing AI that's you know, it's a little bit easier for ambient creatures, but for, you know, companions to do stuff you want, our design choice was to kind of fall back on giving them goals and orders and things like that for them to do. Uh, n not ever really try to predict what you want them to do. Uh, so we've tried to put in a lot of different ways that the player can manage that from, you know, setting their level of aggression to grouping dinosaurs and kind of giving them uh, group commands or having them follow you, having them attack your target uh, or, you know, things like that. And so the, the, what we try to do on top of that is because of the variety of AI in our game, we try to give each creature something that's unique about it that kind of loosely ties into its AI. Um, it, but it's still player controlled, you know. Uh, the Gigantopithecus can kind of throw you off his shoulders. That's the big foot in our game. Um, you know, the the monkey uh, uh, can get thrown into a over a wall and pick locks. You know, so we kind of give them like targeted functionality instead of trying to like wrap a bunch of you know AI functionality into like one or two characters. We just kind of treat them as like a tool set almost. So you might want to go get one character to do one specific thing. And I think we find that it's less frustrating because you know that like one type of AI is going to do one thing for you, and it's probably not going to do the rest of the other things uh, well anyway because it's not even designed to do those things. So you might go you know get a different type of creature uh, to you know. Um, be better at attacking or, or hunting or something like that. And so I think the expectations are more about uh, on the player of selecting the right tool set to do what you want. And then there's like less burden on the AI to kind of always fill that gap for you. Uh, it gives more agency, I think, uh, to the player and how they interact with those creatures. And then when they're wild, I mean, they just kind of do what they do. They have behaviors, they have an ecosystem, they're kind of sometimes attacking you, sometimes paying attention to the other creatures. And so that's kind of a different situation, and we put a lot of you know, thought into that, too, of like how do these creatures all interact with each other, because we want it to feel alive. And then so what, 
on our second pass of AI, we'll really be focusing more on that, like the how the creatures react in the wild and stuff like that, while fixing all the little annoying things that people have with, you know, having them as companions, you know, making sure that they don't do dumb things, get stuck on physics objects, or like do the wrong thing when you expect them uh, to, to follow a different command that you wanted. And so that's kind of our approach to the whole thing. And people can expect to see kind of a, a polish pass on our AI uh, probably next year sometime before we finally ship. We still have about 50 creatures to get in the game that you can turn into companions one way or the other. So, And I guess I guess the way you're talking about that is it's similar to the way Metal Gear Solid 5 handles their companions where they're not they're not as much companions in the way you think of it in, in Fallout or Skyrim and they're more tools, right? You, you, yeah. You bring D-Dog when you need somebody to, to scout. You bring... Uh, quiet when you need someone to snipe it it's very specific sort of things and i think it helps like reducing the expectation that these are going to be like very smart mm -hmm. and kind of takes the pressure off us to like have to make them handle all these different situations it really lets us keep them as just kind of creatures that do what they do and have kind of specific dispositions and things that they might be good at or whatever and thinking of it more like you know Pokemon or something and not so much you know that it's going to be your your AI companion that's going to go everywhere and play like a co-op style game with you. I'm just getting distracted now by Chris's companion sitting on his lap. <laughs> yeah. That I is a so. very good AI companion you have. Uh, well I don't know what the AI part uh, he, he's missing a bit in the eye department. <laughs> Um, okay, let me get him. Let me get him on camera a little bit more. There you go. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> yeah, his he's been on an AI routine of running around the house, and he was doing something in the other room. I don't know what, but anytime he's gone for more than a couple minutes, I know he's destroying something that I care about. So, <laughs> right. And in I that think regard, I think D Dog is, or excuse me, Dog Meat is more realistic because Dog Meat just does whatever Dog Meat wants. <laughs> yeah, I saw I saw dog meat. I was um, doing something in a settlement, and I ran over, and he was he had a teddy bear in his mouth, and he was like shaking it and throwing it up in the air and catching it. And when when I ran over, it disappeared. I don't know where he got it. I did not give him anything at that point, <laughs> so I don't know. I even looked in his inventory, and I didn't see it. So I think he probably ate it. Sounds like a dog. Yep. Sorry, Chris. You were gonna say something though. I was gonna say uh, probably the most important. Part of your companions is like, can you dress them up? Can you yeah. put put different outfits on them? Uh, Goggles. If you pretty much everything I find in Fallout, I'm like, can I stick this on the dog? Can I can I can he wear this? I guess that's kind of what it boils down to. Like, can they be a dress up toy for you? <laughs> well, is that an, is that an important part? Because I've never I've never done that in yeah, any well, companion I mean, game. It, you know, there's there. You know, there's there's the the practical part where you give them better armor and weapons and things like that. But then there's like, you know, if I'm wearing a trench coat and a and and a you know an old timey hat, and maybe I want my my uh, companion to wear something similar, or maybe I want them to, you know, if like a lot of times you'll find like two outfits that that you or two sets of armor that you really like and it's like well I don't want to just wear one and never see the other one so you stick it on your whoever's following you. <laughs> and if you find a bandana you gotta put it on the dog. Oh yeah. Of course. It's just the way it is. <laughs> it's just the way the game works. Dog, yeah. Um I actually always thought that the bandana was like an automatic thing, but apparently I'm wrong about that. Um whoop excuse me. I just messed up the cameras. But let's let's jump along and actually talk about something different. Let's stop talking about Fallout as as sad as I am oh, about okay. not talking about Fallout anymore. Uh, which is funny because I actually have barely played the game, so I don't know why I'm <laughs> upset about not talking about Fallout, but that's okay. Uh, let's talk about something I'm also really excited about, which is Star Wars. Um, and this is not just specifically Star Wars Battlefront, which did come out today, but... I, I think none of us have played it. I know I played the beta a little bit, but I don't think anybody has played the release version um, amongst us. So let's just... I, I just want to gush about Star Wars. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, so, did, I did hop into the release version because of uh, EA Early Access. Oh. What do uh, you, what'd you right. think so far then? Uh, I didn't play too much of it. Again, I was mostly looking at uh, Endor and 
looking at the jungle, but <laughs> I, I, it did seem to run a lot better than the beta, and I, I think that they've just done a really good job of immersion into the Star Wars IP with this title. I mean, of course they had to, because that's like, I don't know, 70% of the game's appeal, I think. Um, but, you know, just speaking in general about the game, I really liked it uh, playing both the beta and now, because I feel like it's going back to kind of like what made the original Halo so awesome. You know, it's just good fun. It felt it feels like anybody can get in there and feel like they're being somewhat competitive and, and, and taking part in these giant battles that are part of this IP that everybody loves. And so I think they did a really good job with it. Uh, I don't know. I haven't played it long enough to see if the depth is really there, but I, I have like some of the things I've been trying to do with the battle progression stuff and putting different objectives in there. Haven't been a fan so far of the aerial combat, but maybe I just haven't played it enough. Uh, it just seems a little, I've, you know, there's, I think that when it comes to the Battlefield style games, there's always people who are like really good at the air combat, and mm -hmm. I'm not usually one of them. It always kind of seems like it's a little too expert mode for me. Uh, and it, it, I just, the TIE Fighters and the X Wings, and every time I've hopped in one uh, on Battlefront, I just immediately get killed. And so that's the only thing I'm just like, eh. I don't know, maybe a few more hours, and I'll, I'll, I'll feel like that's a, a little bit better part of the game. But overall, yeah. you know, I think it's good. I really like their transitions. I like, you know, going back and forth. I feel like they've captured the, you know, the feel of the franchise very well, and, you know, from start to finish on it. Yeah, that's the thing that has impressed me most about it as well, is kind of completely separate from if you like the actual gameplay, if you like the actual shooting, if you do or don't like this and that. They've really, really done a good job making it look and sound and feel like the Star Wars universe. The, the, just the sound design alone is straight out of the, the original trilogy movies. It's really impressive. And all the stormtroopers look like stormtroopers and the rebels look like rebels. Like it, it, it's very, very faithful to, to what Star Wars feels like. Um, and again, that's completely separate from if you think the gameplay is too casual or whatever, like that's fine, that's fair, that's your opinion. It's just that this completely far from that. It's it's just it's very impressively and it's impressive to look at. It's I, I was sharing a picture earlier that I saw on Reddit of just this incredible Endor shot. Jesse, you said you jumped into Endor as well, and it almost looks photorealistic in some spots. Yeah, they've done a great job with it. I mean their engine their engine is phenomenal. I mean Yeah. It's it's just crazy that it scales from you know the the consoles all the way up to high end PC and looks almost the same. I mean, just phenomenal engine. So, wish it was a public <laughs> engine that anybody could use, but I guess that's their secret sauce. Getting jungle jealousy there is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Although you know, one thing I have to say about those games is, you know, I mean, Unreal can do stuff like that too when the whole environment's pretty much static, which is. Which is the case on a lot of, the, of these games. It's very difficult for us because everything can be destroyed in arc. Trees can be chopped down. Rocks can be, you know, broken apart. So we, we take a huge hit in terms of performance for everything to not be pre-calculated. So. Yeah, and so a, a little more on the actual gameplay. I know we talked about Battlefront a while ago when the open beta was going. And James, you and Evan kind of were raising concerns about the VoIP. And the fact, or the lack of VoIP and stuff like that. I mean, have have any of your concerns uh, changed at all, or just as as you've seen more of it, has has your uh, opinion or your personally worries like, changed? Uh, it, not really. I I think I have the same concerns. Um, I mean, the VoIP problem will not be a huge problem for a lot of people um, if they have their secondary service, but it's going to be hard for like a community to form because of that, or harder, um, perhaps, for a game like this, for a community to form out of it. I still like am worried, and I'm still, like, I, based on reviews I've read, uh, uh, the gameplay, people don't really know how uh, it'll go, what kind of a ceiling it's going to have. Um, uh, because of like the power up system and the progression, uh, I, I really, really am still. I don't like the fact that I get into an A wing by running over a glowing icon. Like everything in this game is so detailed and so beautiful, um, 
and true to Star Wars, except uh, it's so jarring, like you get an upgrade or you hop into a vehicle or you become Darth Vader by running over like an old school like PlayStation 2 power up. You know what I mean? It's so out of place and it's so weird. Um, it really, really bothers me. And maybe that's being nitpicky, but as a fan of like Star Wars uh, and Battlefield games, I think like the fact that you get into a vehicle and they're physically there, um, it, it makes uh, you know a big difference. Um, and I think maybe they do it to, uh, uh, I guess, level the playing field. So Battlefield games always had a problem, like people would camp the vehicles and so on and so forth. But I feel like there's better solutions than just like get, giving power ups. Um, but also maybe that's because they want it to appeal to as broad an audience as possible, and they think simplifying it is a better answer. Um, but I don't think simplification is necessarily how you make a game appealing. Um, I mean, you can look at survival games, for example, or uh, um, you know, uh, Minecraft or puzzle games, of, or just all sorts of mechanically dense games, and all sorts of people are playing them. Um, so I, I don't know. I'm kind of concerned on that regard. I think Battlefront is going to have a hell of a good sequel. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't think this is going to be the one that I really get into. Um, so we'll see. Uh, I, I'm definitely going to play it uh, because Star Wars is the shit. Um, but If they had a sequel, would they call it Star Wars Battlefront 2? Oh, that's a good question. Because then, cause then <laughs> would you have two copies of Star Wars Battlefront and two copies of Star Wars Battlefront 2? <laughs> that just seems, yeah, that just seems like we're going down a rabbit hole we don't want to go down. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, Star Wars, it, it, you know, in general, Star Wars is exciting and the movies are coming out and the What's game... this thing I read today? Disney's going to try to put out one every year now. I didn't fully read the article. I just read the headline. I was like, oh, that doesn't sound like the greatest idea. One movie or one game? <laughs> one movie. Yeah, well, they're, they're doing something where they're doing a new trilogy movie every other year and a spinoff movie in between. So oh, okay. this year is episode seven and the next year i believe it's called star wars like rogue one or rogue yeah. it might just be called rogue um yeah. which is supposed Actually, to be one of the screenwriters is ex pc gamer uh alumni so that's kind of cool i didn't Here. even know that there you go and uh and he so star wars rogue is going to follow like the rebels or something and then they're going to do Episode 8 the year after that, and then they're going to do, I think, Solo, or is it the Boba Fett movie? There's a Boba Fett spinoff movie and a young Han Solo spinoff movie. And then one of those comes, and then they'll do Episode 9, and then the last one will come. So Actually, I mean, I think it's a good idea if they can pull it off. I mean, people go crazy over the alternate storylines. I mean, they just have to be able to make sure that it, they don't suck. <laughs> <was> yeah. Problem. <laughs> that, is, that is the key in making many things, I think. <laughs> Make sure it's not awful. Good. Oh yeah. Um, no, yeah. It's it's interesting how much stuff is coming with Star Wars, and and there's a lot of Star Wars games coming out, and uh, what you call it? The oh god, how am I blanking on the MMO name? The Old Republic. The Old Republic yeah. is getting it expanded upon as well. It is almost surprising that there are not more Star Wars games coming out. To be perfectly honest, when you look at a franchise like Warhammer. Warhammer is getting literally dozens of games. Right. When like no, that's not an exaggeration. It has I think there are at least 3 games, 3 Warhammer games have already come out this year and there's at least another 16 or 17 in development. It's it's amazing to me that Warhammer has more games being made than something like Star Wars owned by EA. I I I figured they would have just been pumping stuff out. Yeah, I I bet I bet uh Disney's kind of I don't know, when, when the rights went over, I wouldn't doubt that there was some kind of like hard reset. And I bet they had a bunch of games going, um, or at least in, in the works, uh, or something, or, you know, because it's Star Wars, why wouldn't you be, you know, making those games? Because they, I don't want to say they print money, but uh, there's an audience, a built-in audience there of some kind. That's a nicer um, way of saying it. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I, I mean, I, no doubt there was a hard reset. I wouldn't doubt that, like, the assets that uh, 
are coming out of Battlefront are, are going to be used like in a bunch of games uh, coming out of EA in the future. Like, it seems silly to me that they would just use it exclusively for Battlefront. But you're going to see more Star Wars games than you ever want to see in the next 10 years, man. More Star Wars in general. It's going to be overload. Yeah, I mean, they definitely, like, immediately canceled 1313, you know. Yeah, right? when, which and so I think you're right. There's definitely, like, a reset where it was like, hold on, let's slow down, you know, let's kind of do this right. So at least that's good. I, I think it, it probably will start to ramp up because you can't not make them. I mean, the Star Wars, well-made Star Wars games are just, like, everybody loves them. They're just gold. So, And I guess this is a weird thing to think about, but we are actually at, the beginning of a Star Wars franchise now. You know, this is, like we just said, they're going to be making a new movie every year for the next five or years or so. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we look at it and there's only a couple games coming out now, but it's because this is, the be like you said, this is the beginning of the ramp. This is, mm -hmm. they're getting ready for not just one year, one movie, but a long time and a lot of Star Wars games. Um... We, we had a, we re-promoted a, a piece today on the site that I just posted in chat called The Complete History of Star Wars on PC. That's just, there have been so many Star Wars games. The first one was just called Star Wars and was released for the Atari in 1988. You know, it's, 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 it's a series with a long history in video games. Um, and I don't think that they'll just walk away from that. I, I think they'll probably throw themselves fully into it like we said yeah do you, do you guys have a favorite star wars game i was gonna ask because i didn't know if that list was going up yet but it is do you guys have like a favorite i don't even know chris if you like star wars or not <laughs> that's your jam um that yeah, question I like... that question is about to determine if you keep your job by the way <laughs> we will tell tim oh no um you know i i i liked star wars um i'm a fan of the original trilogy like probably most people mm -hmm. i'm old enough to have seen star wars the first one in the theater i remember very vividly that uh people were chanting because the showing was late they were chanting we want the show i was five and wow. i had no idea what was going on but i do remember you know i remember seeing the first uh, moments of the movie very clearly um when it came to gaming i played uh, X-Wing and TIE Fighter um, like crazy. I thought they were they were great. Um, <clears throat> I played uh, Rebel Assault 2. Um, I'm not sure what else I've played. Oh, uh, Dark Forces. Uh, yeah. I really I really like because I had been you know playing Doom like crazy and this was like, what? It's Star Wars but it's also Doom? Um, uh, so I played that like crazy. Uh, I played that for the first time on stream a couple months mm -hmm. ago, and it, that game is awesome. It holds up, huh? It's yeah, it's just great. I mean, Doom yeah. is is a hard game to to, I guess, not be fun to a certain extent. Um, in terms of like the new the new movies, you know, I will absolutely watch them, but I, I, I don't know. I'm not super excited for for some reason i mean seeing like han solo back on the screen i was like well okay i didn't really feel the emotions i was expecting i didn't really feel nostalgia um i'll see them obviously i want to see them um but i'm not like i don't have opening day tickets or anything like that i don't know i don't know when my sort of passion died down it may have been something to do with those other movies that came out um <laughs> but i'll still like i'll still watch the original trilogy from time to time um i still i still do love the first three movies and um i'm not super hyped i hope they're good i hope they're good well the original trilogy well, it may have been terrible but it was responsible for what is in my opinion my favorite star wars game which is the star wars racer episode one pod racer game the game pod that racing pod, pod racing was really good that pod racer game is Great. so ridiculously good it i remember when i when i first played it it was the first racing game that i had played that really felt just fast right it just felt like you were going way too fast for the the, the pods and the course and everything like that yeah they did a good job at ca kind of capturing the speed of that stuff i was really impressed and i also like that like even if you crash 40 times like they'll rubber band a couple other racers to you so you're never 
you never feel like you're out of it. Like, oh, I can still catch those two guys when they're basically just sitting there waiting for you. Um, but I kind of appreciated that, you know, even if you screw up on the first lap, you're not just racing the next two laps by yourself. They're like, well, we made these two idiots sit there until you got your shit together. <laughs> what was the name of that Star Wars game that was like the arcade one where you went through like all these things? You like you did pod racing, you did like, oh. you know, it was like, you know, like Star almost Wars like arcade. a light gun game. It's called? What? Yeah. Was it just Star Wars Arcade? Maybe. I just remember playing that game a lot in the arcade because I was like, this is crazy. I'm going through like the whole movie and you just try to get like as far <laughs> as you can. I was just to die with the lightsaber battle with Darth Vader. Or Darth Vader. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Uh. Yeah, there there were some. There's been some silly arcade games in general for Star Wars. There was the like, I know there was a Pod Racer machine yeah. for for a different Pod yeah. Racing game, and there was one where that. you had a lightsaber and you had to like hold the lightsaber up to the screen. Yeah. Man. Cool. Well, uh, here's a question: Do you guys think that Star Wars would ever get a survival game, like Lost <laughs> on Dagobah, and you have to you have to fight the elements seems kind of obvious i mean or on hoth you, you got to cut open the tauntaun and <laughs> oh god craft craft a sleeping bag and that oh. sort of thing oh man well let's talk a bit about uh early access survival games seeing as we do have the developer of an well, early hey, access yeah. survival game with us today um oh that's right <laughs> <laughs> so i i want to talk mainly about my first question with this is there are obviously a lot of early access survival games to the point where, Chris, you've done like a dozen different diaries of gameplay diaries of different early access survival games. Um, I don't know if this is entirely true, but Ark is definitely one of the most successful of them, I think, even just from a sales perspective. It's definitely, in my opinion, one of the more fun ones, but from a sales perspective, you guys sold like a million copies of Ark in a month. Um which was incredible, and you've gone on to sell a million more, and I'm sure more than that. Um, yeah, and, we're up to two point two now. Wow. Okay. So, but what's so attractive about? And this is a question for everyone, not just you, Jesse. But what's so attractive about the survival game genre, or early access development, or alternatively, the flip of that? What's so attractive about? early access that it attracts all of like the survival survival games to it because i feel like most early access games are survival game or excuse me most survival games are start in early access well i think it's because the genre isn't fully defined yet there's a lot of experimental sort of gameplay mechanics that go into it uh, there's not like a guaranteed formula for success um, and with early access on PC you know it's it's much easier to ship a game like that uh, than it is to you know ship a box title or a console title uh, and it, it removes a lot of the risk if you're if you're going to try something new that hasn't been done before um, and I think that also the reason that a lot of people have been taking on survival games is because it's kind of just I, almost all of them really have a role-playing aspect to it. You're really putting yourselves in the shoes of a survivor. You're, whether it's single-player or multiplayer, a lot of it is you making your own story, your own path through the world. Almost all survival games have like so many ways to accomplish something, whether it's crafting or you know finding certain items or, or doing something of that nature. And so it kind of takes the onus off the developer to create this, like, grand, you know, linear experience or even branched experience and kind of lets you put breadcrumbs into kind of a sandbox experience and, and put a lot of that back on the players, which the players actually, I think, enjoy, the players who enjoy survival games, uh, getting into kind of the environment, the, the lore, the theme of the survival game uh, as part of its, like, key offering you know and so I think that's why there's so many of them and being a nascent genre it's everybody's trying to figure out what works and you know what's the secret sauce and there's a lot of opportunity for people to do that uh, a, a game I'm really excited to play that's more story driven I think it's uh, 
the Solace, Solace Project or whatever I think it's called on Xbox One. It's coming out pretty soon. You know, that's like a space-based, totally sci-fi uh, survival game that seems like it has a lot of story into it. And so you just see it like the survival genre is not limited. There's like there's cartoon stuff. There's you know tech stuff. There's RPG stuff. There's you know it's just, it, it's everything. It's like it's just a layer of, of that you can apply to almost any type of aesthetic or storyline. And I think that's why you're seeing so much of it right now. It's just it's almost like endless what you could do in a survival game. And we chose dinosaurs because we just thought it was the most broadly appealing thing, and it worked out pretty well so far. So. <laughs> Yeah, one thing I've I've really enjoyed in in the survival genre um, is you you get kind of a both a single player and a multiplayer experience out of it. You know, um, Daisy, which was one I I played a lot. Um, I mean, it really. I mean, you could spend hours and hours uh, doing your own thing and never seeing another player and never um, you know having to think about other players and then you suddenly turn a corner and there's someone there and that's when the kind of multiplayer kicks in. Um, I'm not a huge multiplayer guy so that appealed to me that I could spend so much time off on my own and uh, uh, you know exploring and and you know looting and things like that but then when I wanted kind of a multiplayer experience I could either head towards somewhere where I knew there'd be people or sometimes it would just happen. Um, which gave it kind of a lot of tension and a lot of excitement too, and I think a lot of survival games are like that, where you do kind of have both uh, single-player goals, stuff that that you might do by yourself, and then there's also um, you know a communal type of experience at the same time. But what about? I mean, a part of it comes to me that it, it seems to be like a lot of survival games kind of at their core have the same sort of gameplay loop, if that makes sense, which makes them great for early access because you can get this very workable, playable prototype that is where the gameplay comes from the players rather than the the content of the game to a certain extent. And then it's great in early access because you can just build on top of that. You can build the content after the fact around the community rather than just having to have like you said a boxed game where everything is already in there you the the actual core of the gameplay comes from how people interact with each other and interact with the world not necessarily to use arc as an example how many dinosaurs there are it's just that the more that you add the more varied the experience becomes the more lasting it becomes but that's not necessarily needed to just start playing no i think another uh um aspect is that these games are so systemic and that there's like actually like we're it's new just like the genre itself like you were saying jesse but there's also like an audience there that's fairly new that is really interested in how games develop and uh you know how games develop is also or at least publicly uh, is is uh is changing and early access is part of that and uh i i just honestly think that like uh, part of the appeal to these games isn't just, well, I can't wait until this is all done and, like, you know, it's 1.0 and it's the perfect expression of this dinosaur survival game, you know? It's how people um, experiment together and getting on forums and interacting with developers. Um, it's, it's, that is sort of all part of the inherent experience to a lot of people. And it's what's most interesting to me, at least, about this kind of thing is, you know, these games are so systemic, uh, outwardly systemic, that you can really, really feel how the changes affect it immediately. And it's fun. It's cool. Everyone's, like, sort of observing development now. And, like, most people I know who play ARC, I don't <laughs> I know a lot of young people because my sister teaches uh, fourth grade, and almost all of them like play Ark or uh, Minecraft or something of the like. And so you're getting a lot of these people interested and it's going to start a new kind of audience for, you know, uh, games in general. Um, I don't know. So I think that's another part of it as well. Well, sandbox games like that are just super appealing to, to young people too. In a way oh. that when we had the developers, when we had introversion software on, yeah. um, we started talking a little bit about how um, 
Mark Morris's kids didn't even really understand what a mouse was because they'd just been raised on touch screens, right? <laughs> Um, that was just what they knew as how you interacted with a computer or a device is you just touched it, right? And to a certain extent, these survival games, or not survival games specifically, but open world sandboxy games are just kind of what a younger generation of gamers just like know as games, right? Like, why would, why would you make your game linear? Why wouldn't you just have this sandbox? Which is cool to see. I'm not judging this at all. I think it's awesome that this is like the new kind of emerging pattern. But Chris, you mentioned in our gaming confessions piece a while ago that you you hate multiplayer, right? Mm -hmm. So my question is, is hell other people? <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Like, um, do you just dread running into other people in these games, or? It depends. I mean, like I said in, in DayZ, that's kind of what gave the game so much tension. And in fact, it was one of the one of the um, the first multiplayer games where I I really was interested in talking to other people. Um, f for me, I'd never really been in a multiplayer game where you would see someone and they wouldn't have like you know a team color. They wouldn't have a little thing over their head that said what their name was. They would just be there. <clears throat> um, you had no idea who they were, what they were doing. Um, I found that uh, kind of an interesting experience. I even kept a little Tumblr about my everyone I would meet in DayZ, and I would write up, you know, what happened, who they were. I would go up and talk to them and see if they were interested in talking. <clears throat> Back in DayZ, at the beginning, uh, you could actually talk to people. Now it's uh, they kind of shoot you in the face immediately. Um, but back then in the early days, you know, people were a little more inclined to to chat, hang out, you know, embark on something, you know, some guy was like, I'm on a scavenger hunt. I'm like, well, I'll help. And then we'd kind of run off together. Um, so that was really, to me, it was, it was kind of the mystery of like, what is this person doing in this game? <clears throat> um, that kind of made it kind of the best part for me was running into people that is typically not the case in in games with me i'm usually more of a hermit well so so jesse how, how do you guys talk about that i guess or discuss that sort of thing in in, in arc like do you is because so many of these games are are developed around the idea of combat which is what you were touching on chris was people just shoot you in the face like is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Do you want people to be talking to each other? Or do you, like, is shooting each other in the face fine? Is sicking raptors on each other the end game, you know? <laughs> well, we like to support all types of play. Um, <laughs> you know, there's people who just like to grief other people. There's people who really like combat. There's people who like competitive modes. That's why we started up Survival of the Fittest. Um, you know, we, we try to integrate player feedback a lot. Uh, recently, we just launched on PVE servers the ability for tribes to declare war on each other, which is kind of a highly requested feature because a lot of people didn't like to be playing on PVP servers where they were always subject to having their bases raided when they weren't logged on and they, you know, were getting just KOS'd all the time uh, for no reason. Uh, and it was kind of, you know, for those people, diminishing their fun in the game because they they weren't given the choice of when they wanted to engage in certain types of multiplayer versus just kind of playing the game the way they wanted to and it was hard to deal with that situation in a PvP environment where the main goal of that is just anything goes and so what a lot of players wanted was in the PvE server mode where you can't damage other players and you can't attack their structures and dinosaurs and kill them uh, there's a lot of requests for those players to have an optional, you know, battle mode where it's like, hey, we want to do some PvP. We build up our base. We want to, you know, go to war with this other tribe and have some fun. Uh, so that's where that mode is kind of coming in, I think, now. And we'll do some balancing and, and figure out what the right way to approach that going forward. But that's kind of like our solution for the players who, who want to have the PvP experience that they are looking for kind of on their own terms. And so it kind of lets everybody play. 
the way they want, and the people who like to do the offline raiding and the griefing can still go on their PvP servers and do that. You can always host your own server and have your own options to do whatever you want. Uh, so up until this point in development, we've really been about choice. Uh, and you can just see as uh, we go forward with our official servers where we're implementing the player feedback, you know, that's one of the things you guys mentioned earlier about uh, the way games are being developed now and people like to observe and be involved in, in games, uh, the uh, game's development. That's really the story of ARC. I mean, so many things in the game have come directly from player feedback, have come from the way, you know, 50,000 people are playing the game every day. There's no way we could ever test or get that type of feedback, you know, four years ago when, you know, we didn't have really access and we had to, you know, get all the way to ship before we could even ha have any testing at that scale. So I think ARC's really benefiting from that, uh, being in early access and hearing the the stories that, that, like you guys are talking about right now and like what you do like and what you don't like about the survival genre or our specific game and trying to find ways to address that in the development of our game. You know, I saw uh, <clears throat> an ARC mod um, that actually takes your dinosaurs out. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, What it does is it's a full conversion um, pirate world. Have yeah. you seen that one? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess they, they uh, you can sail ships and do, like, broadside battles. And I, as far as I know, there aren't dinosaurs. But it sounds like, uh, you know, did you ever think you'd be like someone would take all your dinosaurs away? Oh, well, we figured it was bound to happen. That's kind of why we partnered with Epic to try to get this mod support out. Actually, our um, Alienware was sponsoring our mod contest recently, and that's, I think, uh, one of the top entries uh, for the mod contest uh, is this this pirate mod with this whole pirate ship and all this stuff going on. It's, like, really awesome. And so we've gotten a lot of really fun entries from that, and I think, you know, they're all being whittled down this week and then we'll go into the finals and, and the community voting and all that stuff but people have done some really cool things with the mod toolkit and it's been really exciting to watch you know I I, I love modding and I, I'm sure that mod is awesome but I can't imagine who was like this pirate mod doesn't need dinosaur <laughs> who, con who would consciously make maybe that decision maybe it does Pirates and dinosaurs. Could, <laughs> and you could have a little pterodactyl on your shoulder. It'd be amazing. Come on. Yeah. I'd probably play a game called Pirates and Dinosaurs or watch a movie. <laughs> Maybe watch a movie called Pirates and Dinosaurs. We're too easy. That, oh, that could be the sequel to uh, Cowboys and Aliens. Right. Pirates, Pirates and Dinosaurs. And dinosaurs. <laughs> Just waiting to be made. There's a lot of pirate games on the horizon right now. Actually. Are there? Well, I'm excited to see uh, Rare's game, uh, Sea of Thieves. Oh, you know, yeah, yeah. That much. I mean, uh, from what I gather, um, I never got to see it w while I was at Microsoft because they didn't announce it until after I left. But from what I gather, it's like uh, pretty much a survival pirate game. You have to work together as a team to fully you know, operate the ship, and there's all these things mm -hmm. you have to do to, to do your naval battles and stuff like that. It's really cool art style and stuff like that. So I'm excited to see how that one turns out. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about ARC specifically because, like, I I'm sure you've gotten this question before because, as we said, you know, the survival game genre was pretty saturated when ARC came out, and yet you guys have, have found this wild success. Like, why? what do you credit that to? Is it really just, is the answer just as simple as dinosaurs? I Could think it's it a big part simple? of it. I mean, you know, dinosaurs really have broad appeal. I mean, everybody's grown up at least somewhat brushing up against dinosaurs, whether you're really passionate about it or, you know, it's just something in science class, whatever. Uh, so I think that there's not a lot of regions in, in the world specifically where it's like taboo, you know, like where something like zombies is, you know, it's like, you know, you don't see a lot of like really successful zombie games uh, in Asia and stuff like that, you know, and it's like, it's, I, th I think it's just broad appeal there and I think it's timing. I feel like a lot of people were trying to do a really good dinosaur game, both in early access and, you know, uh, we've seen some stories recently where, you know, games were, have been canceled in the past year. Uh, you know, Jurassic World was, was a game that, you know, was in development around the time ARC, uh, ARC started and unfortunately that, that project is canceled. I, for some reason it's really hard to do. Uh, it, it's, you know, for us being in early access, I think a lot of the barriers of 
of polish were kind of removed. You know, we know we have a lot to polish on the game, so we weren't afraid of that. You know, just make sure everyone knows the version of the game you see now is not finished. And so animations are a little bit wonky. You know, we've gone for a variety of dinosaurs and creatures rather than, you know, making sure everyone is, like, finely polished, which we'll get to later. And we also don't have the sort of hanging over our heads of our, our last game, whatever that was, and we have to live up to that, you know. I mean, I don't think you'd see, like, Naughty Dog going and putting out, you know, an early access title because, you know, it's, it's, it's it, Uncharted 4 is their bar, you know. I mean, so yeah, I think that we've benefited from a lot of that, and just the, the timing of where the genre is at, too, I think really helped us. You know, we, I think we tried to inject a lot of story and variety. We learned from a lot of the good games that came before ARC on what we did and didn't like about the genre. And we really took our best stab at our version of what a survival game should be. And, you know, it, it's resonated with players better than we could have hoped, faster than we could have hoped. And, you know, we've always, from the beginning, thought that ARC would make a really great console game, and that's like our next step, and it's a really exciting moment in the next few months to, to push this out onto Xbox and see what the Xbox gamers think about it. Well, we, uh, we won't hold that against you, let's put it that way, <laughs> PC gamer. Yeah. No, well, you know, it's, it's... The, the great thing, though, is that um, the PC is going to benefit significantly from our console work. I mean, yeah. I was answering some questions in chat earlier uh, for people. Things like loading times and optimization. Uh, a lot of people like to play with the controller on PC. You know, our Xbox control scheme that we've been working on is a hundred times better than the, the one that's in the PC right now. And so I think you'll see a lot of improvements coming back to the game because we're specifically put, trying to put out a great console game. And it's, it's you know, some people might be miffed that we're focusing so much on console, but I really think it's going to make the PC game a lot better for most yeah. people. And we, I, I said that mostly joking, because we yeah. almost always think that any sort of exclusivity, you know, whether it's console to PC, or even like that, that weird stuff that happens between NVIDIA and AMD, where like NVIDIA only has certain drivers for games or whatever, like none of that is healthy for the games industry as a whole, so yeah, I, I think we get that. Um, I, I'd love to hear actually a little bit more about what Chris brought up with mods, because you guys in the Epic Games launcher have like a section for ARC and modding ARC. Yes. Um, what, why, I guess this might be a simple answer to this question, but how much of a priority was modding for you guys or why did, was it a priority? Oh, huge. I mean, from day one. Uh, that's why we got it out so soon after launching Early Access. Uh, we knew that it would extend the life of the game. We knew also we were building a good platform for open world sandbox games, and we really wanted to leverage the Unreal Editor and the Unreal Toolkit uh, for people to create their own experiences out of ARC. You know, that's why we have vehicle support in our dev kit. Uh, you know, it's a little bit wonky right now. We have some bugs to fix, but we don't actually have those vehicles in the main game. We just want to give people the tools to, you know, make a racing game with the, the toolkit, you know. I mean, it, 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 and I think we kind of share Epic's vision for modding as well. That's why we worked, we partnered so closely on this and why we're actually in the launch with them is that the next generation of game developers still coming up through modding and that's where people get their a lot of times their first taste at creating something that's exposed to a huge audience you know if you go by yourself and make a little game that you're very proud of it's it's there's a less of a chance that people are going to be able to experience that game just because of all the reasons you know that you know it's hard to get your game noticed but if you make a great mod you've got like an inbuilt uh, community of people who might want to try the mod. Uh, millions of players, you know, like Skyrim has so many players and the, the game of, or the life of that game is extended, you know, so far because of the mods. And we really hope that the same, same thing happens to ARC, that people play it not just for the game, but for the other games people are creating out of it, like the pirate game and, you know, the Halo mod that people are creating, you know, just whatever, right? So. Have there been any mods that <clears throat> that you've seen or you've tested and thought like, wow, this this would be great as part of our core game and have you or gotten ideas or seen anything that you think would, would be um, officially part of ARC? 
Well, we have done that with a few things. You know, um, in a lot of cases, you know, we had a plan to do something, but we hadn't put it in the game yet, and the modders got to it first. You know, one of those was our angled roofs. We always wanted to make our roofing system for building more robust, but uh, the mod community went and created it and proved out the concept of, uh, you know, having specific pieces before making angled roofs. And, you know, they did the work to prove it out, and we're like, yep. Looks like that's going to be pretty good. People really love it. And so we uh, went and implemented it ourselves. You know, we, we didn't literally take the mod because it wasn't, you know, the right right thing to do for that particular feature. But we we learned a lot from that mod and how players were using it and, and implemented it officially in the game. You know, another example of that was um, breeding. You know, we always wanted to do dino breeding but it, it was kind of a big feature and we really didn't want to do it wrong and we didn't want to have to create a bunch of new art assets um, and the the dino breeding mod proved that people were really passionate about this and it could look pretty good uh, if it was done the right way and so again we took some inspiration from the dino breeding mod and how well it was received and we decided to go ahead with our ambitions of actually putting that into the game officially and you know that's what we ended up with now is is dino, a, a creature breeding is, is fully in the game now mammals um, uh, reptiles uh, everything you know I think we still have a, a, a little bit of work to do on that with the new creatures and stuff like that but again it's, there's just multiple multiple examples of gameplay features or ideas that have just been proven through the mod community. Mm. Very cool. And um, you recently uh, added basically penguins. I don't know, honest to God, how to pronounce the actual name. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm a little rusty on the scientific pronunciations myself of some of these things. <laughs> here, for, for, for the benefit of the, the stream and the YouTube channel, if you're listening on the podcast, I'm, I apologize for this, but... You guys release these really great little book pages, these art books, basically announcing new characters. So this one was the, yes. I think it's the Kairuku, <laughs> maybe, which was basically just this penguin. That's how I say it. Yeah. You know. um, and then also the angler, which is much simpler. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, like, so you've, you've been updating the game pretty consistently, and... What's I guess what's coming next? What are you guys fo focusing on next? Man, so this week we've got the Overraptor coming, which we're pretty excited about. Uh, I think the dossier is out for that guy already. Yeah, but actually, I have that one ready. So. It, yeah, <laughs> um, and you know what we're trying to do now with the creatures because we have so many of them still to add is that you know every creature adds like a, like I mentioned earlier like a little unique gameplay element. You know, with the angler, you get a new item, which is you know it's it's gel, which creates a new type of light source and it's cool because it's a different color and it's like more efficient and stuff like that you know and, and um, even the penguins you know they, they've got their own buffs of, of warmth and cold environments and they have a lot of you know the the oil resource that you can get from them um, so we were trying to give every new creature a purpose in the game and not just have it like be a different size, slightly different statted version of some other creature. And so that's why we put out the dossiers ahead of time. So people kind of know where our head's at, know what we're thinking in terms of how, how this creature is going to impact gameplay and can start to anticipate, you know, the arrival of that creature and how it might change the way they play the game. Cool. And so uh, how often do you guys add creatures like this? I guess I can't just say dinosaurs. Yeah, usually we're about one a week right now. We kind of have a pretty big backlog. So going forward, we put out one new dossier a week, and we're roughly an average of one new creature a week. And that's pretty much fully implemented, ready for people to start testing it. And, you know, we, we usually what happens, we put out a creature, we have a good stab at what we think it should be, but then we get a ton of feedback from the community about, you know, this thing is OP, this thing needs to be nerfed, this thing needs to be buffed, whatever. There's always a lot of feedback. Um, people are very passionate about it. I will use that word. <laughs> and uh, it really helps us kind of dial it in within, you know, uh, the next patch or two to get to somewhere where people are a little bit more happy about the way it might work in the balance of that creature and the resources it gives and the things that it does versus the rest of the game. Well, we can start opening up to questions from Twitch chat as well. So if you are in the chat right now and you have any questions for Jesse about Ark Survival Evolved or in general, if you have any questions for any of us about anything that's on your mind in PC gaming this week, use at PC Gamer in the Twitch chat and we'll be able to pick you out of the lineup. Um, and if you are 
watching on YouTube or listening via the podcast on iTunes or at PCGamer.com. You can always come and watch the stream live and participate in the Q&A at twitch.tv slash PCGamer uh, on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, my beards asks, why is that James guy so handsome? <laughs> it's <laughs> almost like he's biased in his question what? asking. What? Oh, James. <laughs> I, li- I like the comment that not all creatures are, quote, everybody's favorite. <laughs> Just saying. Because we, we always say that when we put out a dossier. We're like, everybody's favorite whatever. <laughs> but I thought that people got that, like, it's the only one of those. So, of course, it's everybody's favorite. <laughs> Everybody's favorite penguin in the yeah. world. Is Everybody's penguins. favorite egg stealing raptor. Yeah, there's there's one of those. So <laughs> of course it's gonna be everybody's favorite one. <laughs> uh, Video Grames asks why Unreal Four. Uh, the source access to the engine C plus uh, plus. It's a you know C, a veteran engine in the industry, very flexible, very extensible. Everybody on the team knows Unreal Engine, has worked with it for over a decade, and it's a modern engine, um, and you know, it's frequently updated and is constantly being improved for consoles and new platforms, and so it's really the only choice for a game like this for us. You know, we've used Unity as well. I mean, I used Unity when I was at Microsoft for three years. Uh, it's a great engine, but it's not an engine I would want to use for an uh, open world survival game, that's for sure. And that's no stabs at other games who might actually use Unity somehow. Maybe they figured it out for themselves. Like, I, I know Rust is on Unity, but I, I wouldn't want to put myself through trying to get it to work for this type of game. It's, it's great for small teams, and, you know, we used it on HoloLens, and it was an awesome engine for that. Uh, but uh, the speed and flexibility of Unreal with full source code access is really the reason we chose it. Cool. Uh, and JBag62 asks... Uh, what do you think of Paladins so far, which just went into closed beta today? I think I'm the only one here who's played Paladins, so I can talk real quickly on that. I haven't um, played it. Oh, you've played it as well? No, no I haven't played it. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I played Paladins back at TwitchCon, and I, I have a write-up about that on the site. We're actually giving away closed beta keys for Paladins. If you go to PCGamer.com, you can enter to win one of those, but... Uh, I enjoyed what I played. I, I thought that the shooting, it was a very, very unique shooter. I really liked the card system. Like, I genuinely liked what they were doing with that. I really liked the art style. I liked the, the pace of the game was much more about defending points instead of, like, running and gunning. It was it was a nice mix-up from shooter uh, other shooters. But I, when I played it, and granted, this was a couple months ago, when I played it, the shooting just kind of felt a little... Um, it lacked feedback to a certain extent, and and so I wasn't really jazzed about that. But I thought overall the game was fun, so I'm interested to see what it what it does and dive into the closed beta a little bit more this week. Maybe I'll be talking about that next week on the show for now playing. Um, we'll see. Let's see. Gamer Perfection asks, "Will you ever be able to pick up dodos and hold them?" <laughs> That's for Jesse, I believe. I mean, it's kind of one of those things where. The dodos, everybody loves them. Anything that's fun with them is probably bound to happen in some form or another. I know right now people really want to launch dodos on the catapult. We'll see. <laughs> uh, Sith Afrikan asks, when are we getting beards? Very excitedly. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know the exact timeline we have on further modifications to the character system, but we really do want to add beards, hairstyles. There's actually a couple really cool mods out there that do this already. Um, so we really want to give people an integrated solution so they don't have to run a mod on their server where you can c- customize your character's look even more. Uh, one of the things we're waiting on for that is a better hair lighting model for the technical people out there um, in Unreal. We just don't want to develop that ourselves. And it's not something that's part of the engine right now. And so once uh, Epic gets around to putting in an anisotropic hair lighting model, we'll probably start making our hair and beard modifications so people can start using them. I really appreciate that you said that with a straight face, by the way. <laughs> um, let's see. Genofix asks, do you think the next Fallout game is a Ob- is obliged or obligated to push the series forward more than Fallout 4 did. Uh, and this is something that actually came up a couple times and we've talked about a little bit, is 
Fallout 4 is, is a very, very fun game, but it didn't really do much to prove upon Bethesda's engine, really, and the way they make games. Um, do you think, James, how about you? You've played, or James and Chris both, you've been playing a lot of Fallout. Do you think that the next Fallout game is going to need to do something more, or can they just release a Fallout 5 on the same engine, just prettier again? Uh, you know, I, I guess I don't have a huge problem with what the game is. Uh, it, it's a role-playing game. Um, you're doing fun things. I think maybe people have nitpicky problems with it, but it felt like what I expected it to be. Uh, as far as, I meant to kind of ask this, and we don't have to talk about it now because we go on forever, but as far as what Fallout, like what could they do, where do you go from here? I, do people want um, just b better graphics? Is that it? Do they want uh, an engine free of bugs? Uh, that's like not going to happen overnight or in five years with an open world game, you know, this systemic. It's just, you know, to me, personally, uh, I'm kind of just in awe of any open world game doing a lot at once. And I don't think everyone has that perspective. Um, certainly, they can make improvements. Uh, and certainly, like, they will. As far as, like, what that, you know, what could redeem in, in these people's eyes, you know, Fallout 5. I don't know. Like, wh what do you want? Do you want to play six characters at once? I don't. <laughs> like, do you want to be a Deathclaw? I don't think like bigger and badder is where this these kind of games. Go. But that's just me. I think it's it's fine. And okay, the Mafia Joe asks Jesse, will we be seeing more mythical creatures like the dragon, or will that be something implemented as DLC, perhaps? So, we have one more boss to reveal that we haven't revealed yet. I wouldn't say it's a mythical creature, but it is not a dinosaur. And the going forward, we have some plans for Ark after this game. And it's likely you'll see non-dinosaur related boss creatures for the foreseeable future when we do introduce a new one. Okay. If we, if we guess what it is, will you tell us? Or? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> it is the mountain. You have to fight the mountain. It's the volcano. No, yeah. just Everybody's afraid that thing's going to erupt one day. <laughs> I'm, I'm counting on it. <laughs> it may not be soon, but I know you guys are going to blow that up. At some I point. do a server reset. Yeah. I will say that next time we have to do a map change that's going to impact people's bases, we're probably going to try to do some in-game notification with boundaries uh, or something like that ahead of time so people aren't surprised when their bases get destroyed with a big buffer zone. <laughs> Anything near this is likely to get destroyed. <laughs> uh, there's a couple questions about um, optimizations for single player and that sort of thing and when that's coming. I think general optimizations uh, will be coming in if not before the end of the year or very early next year because of our console work and we'll be rolling that stuff back in soon but even just starting this week uh, we're working on getting some of our console optimizations back to the PC branch specifically with loading times of not just loading into the game but uh, loading hitches between areas of the map streaming content in more efficiently um, and we have a few I think graphical optimizations that help improve frame rate and, and things like that so it's just kind of an ongoing process you know, we the game's actually only been in development for a year, and the final version doesn't ship for another eight or nine months. So we just have to remember that's the state we're at in development. And we're sorry. We try to give people a whole range of graphics options so that they can play it regardless of the PC specs that they have. Uh, but that stuff will come naturally uh, as we get into our alpha and beta phases. See, Genofix asks again, do you think PC gaming needs more media coverage to make our platform more mainstream? And I just wanted to bring this one up because I think PC gaming is the mainstream, man. I think <laughs> that, I, I, no, I, I, I think that PC gaming is doing just fine. I think it's doing great, in fact. So, I mean, well, I mean we obviously have the, the media <laughs> love covering it, but. Um, there do seem to be a lot of PC games. There are a lot of PC games, yes. Yeah, it's it's funny. Like, uh, 
It's interesting to be someone who's developing both, right? I mean, on the one hand, developing PC games is so great because of the flexibility. On the other hand, it's it's almost more challenging than developing for consoles because you have to account for everybody's machines, you know? And we get a lot of questions of, like, how do you expect ARC to run well on an Xbox when it doesn't run well on my arbitrary configured computer? And it's like, well, that's kind of the answer. I mean, we can optimize the heck out of... Uh, the Xbox because everyone who has an Xbox One has the exact same experience and some people may have a really high spec computer and one part of their computer is ta causing the game to run terribly and you know it's really hard to solve those problems you know uh, but when you have machines that are like kind of running really well or you know, at the top end of the range I mean there's no question that like Arc looks best on you know a high end PC and you know playing on your TV in your living room in that scenario uh, especially when we get our, our console controller configuration back in, it's really going to be very exciting, especially to me, because I really like the big screen PC gaming experience. A dapper velociraptor, which is a great name, asks, and I'm just picturing this literally as a <laughs> Dap, velociraptor in a top hat, but yes, asks, of course. Uh, yo, Jesse, options to interact with our dinosaurs, question mark, like pet my penguin, <laughs> rub my Rex's muzzle, and hug my fluffy fat giant ground sloth. <laughs> that sounds like something somebody should prove out in a mod. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's been a lot, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of interactions people could uh, dream I'm, of. I'm, I'm sorry, even if you didn't have an answer for that, I just had to read it out loud. It's, I know. It's a beautifully phrased question. That's pretty funny. Um, unfortunately, I think we're running out of time. Um, but thank you very much, everyone, for watching. Uh, thanks again, a special thanks to Jesse Rapsick for joining us today, man. It was great to have you on. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, hopefully when we're back in our office in San Francisco, if you're ever in the area, we can have you on in person. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Do a whole live show thing. Um, yeah, yeah. Also, thank you again to Chris Livingston and James Davenport for being along for the ride once again. Chris, we're not going to be on Skype anymore, so we're going to have to figure that out to get you back on, but... Well, I might have to actually drag myself out and come down to the new office. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's nice. It's got brick. It's it's very cool. Um, we'll show you around the office, everyone watching and listening as well. We'll give you an audio tour and visual <laughs> for those watching along. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for watching. That is all the time we have for today. Uh, we will be back once again, twitch.tv slash pcgamer at 1 p.m. Pacific Time next Tuesday. Um, and, of course, anywhere you please, at any time you please, on YouTube.com slash PCGamer or at PCGamer.com or our podcast on iTunes. There's lots of places to listen. And if you're listening to this, you've probably figured that out. So thank you very much, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Bye. See Thanks, ya. Jesse.